uh, tried my modeling career and didn't work out. Uh, my acting career in Hollywood ended in WWZ, the World the War Z with Brad Pitt. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, wow. I saw Brad Pitt alive, but it ended up with a Palestinian girl with a job number 100. <laughs> <laughs> this is my big Hollywood role. Uh, very interesting role. I yelled a lot and ran away from zombies. <laughs> That's it. Uh, so that was my acting career in Hollywood, and um, and you know it's one of the questions that in the other sessions um, somebody uh, uh, the the moderator wanted to ask me is how come you're also uh, I did stand-up comedy, I acted, I'm a journalist, uh, I'm doing a lot of things, and how come you're doing this and not only a journalist? How come this is part of your career? And I was thinking about this, and a lot of people are asking me the same question in, uh, in Israel too, and I'm saying, especially when I'm sitting with young people, and with you, the average, I think, age here is 25. Sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Take this as a compliment. <laughs> Take this. Yeah. So, you know, we are living in an era where nothing is uh, for granted. And not that nothing is for granted. Nobody is guaranteeing anything. Like, you can start as a journalist, but we are always looking in life for safety nets. And for me, I know that um, I started my career as a journalist for Palestinian issues. And uh, I started as a reporter for uh, Palestinian uh, affairs in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip, although we weren't able to get into the Gaza Strip. and. I remember that when I started this, I said to myself, okay, do I want to end up as the Palestinian correspondent for, pal for Palestinian issues in Israeli media? Do I, want, do I look at myself in 10 years, 20 years, doing the same job? And I looked at the, uh, one journalist that we had, his name was uh, Moti Kirshenbaum, he, he passed away this year. And I looked at him and I said to myself, wow, this guy, he did a lot of things. He did, he was a journalist, he acted in movies, he did some documentary movies. And I said to myself, okay, why to, why to do only one thing? Why, if you need to be a lawyer or you're going to med school, you need only to be a doctor or only to be a lawyer or only to be a journalist or only to be an accountant? Why not to evolve? Why not to study about cultures? Why not to open yourself to other things than only to be in one specific thing? So my safety net, uh, especially in the Israeli media, which is a very, very small media, it was uh, very important because for an Israeli Muslim <coughs> women, uh, the glass ceilings are very low. It's not, you know, in 2000, in, it was in 2007, that I was the first Israeli Arab anchor on Israeli TV. It took 10 years later that I will be the first Israeli Arab woman to anchor a prime time show on Israeli media. It's not obvious that an Israeli Arab woman got the prime time show on Israeli Channel 2. I'm going on air with this show on November, and for me, I cannot believe that people are saying, wow, this is history. You made history in Israeli TV. How, and, and, and I'm looking at what is happening on American media or on foreign media. And I'm saying that 
who you are and what you are is not an issue. It's, it's not supposed to be an issue. Sometimes it's even an advantage. See Christian Amanpour, or um, uh, Farid Zakaria, or any other foreign or uh, different color um, anchors that you can see on TV. So when I got this uh, knowledge that I'm going to have the primetime show, it was, uh, and somebody told me that it's a history, that you're doing history in Israeli TV. For me, I felt a little bit sad. I felt a little bit sad that in 2016, we still need to make history in these kind of things. And it's like I felt sad when I light the torch in the Israeli Independence Day. When um, the first, I remember the first phone call that I got and uh, it was, it was um, you know, I think it, I said it like, it was one of the happiest days of my life. And to light the torch in the Israeli Independence Day is not an obvious thing. It's one of the biggest honors that the State of Israel can give someone uh, as, as, um, as the stage to, to be part of something. And literally when I got the phone call, I didn't understand why. It's like, I, I, I did, okay, what did I do? Why do I deserve this honor? And when I read the explanations or the, the reasons that the committee put out, one of the reasons was that I promoted pluralistic views in Israeli society. That I promoted um, non-racist discussion in Israeli society. And in 2016, to have the word breakthrough in uh, racist conversation or in a pluralistic society, this is something that is unfortunate. This is something that you are asking yourself, how come we are still need somebody to break through? in a racist discussion. And when I'm sitting here and, and you know, I'm sitting in the JCC in the Jewish Community Center, and I think that there is no suitable people or than the Jewish people to understand how would a Muslim woman or a Muslim man in Israel or a Christian Arab man or a Christian Arab woman in Israel would feel when they are in the Israeli society. I believe that uh, some of the people who grew up here, they went through racism. When they said that they are Jewish, when they said that uh, they are part of a certain community, or they said that they are pro-Israel, they experienced some kind of a racism. For me, racism was something that, it was a friend, that accompany me all my life. If it was since I was in school, when I used to get into school, and I remember that, uh, that I, it's like, you know, um, kids, because I was the only Arab girl in school, so kids picked up on me. So they beat me up and they made my life miserable. <clears throat> and I remember that when I understood that I'm the different girl, that I am like the girl that uh, is, uh, that she is from the kids that we are going to pick on. So there's the fat boy, there is the, the guy with the glasses, there is the girl with the braces, and there's the Arab Muslim girl. The day that I understood that, I decided that I'm going to do everything in my power to make people to make the people in front of me understand that I'm just like them. Not only that I'm just like them, I am better than them. <clears throat> Not that I'm better, I'm going to excel. I'm going to do the best that I can to show them that the fact that I'm Muslim, the fact that I'm Arab, is not a disadvantage, it is an advantage. So I remember that every single year, 
I dressed up like Queen Esther <laughs> in Purim. <laughs> Every single year. Lucy, maybe you can dress up in Purim like Japanese. No, Esther, I'm all gone. <laughs> Lucy, maybe you can dress up like a clown. No, Esther, I'm all gone. But every single year, I remember that one of the reporters in one of the first interviews that, I, that uh, somebody interviewed me, he told me, Lucy, do you understand that you dressed up like Queen Esther for Purim? It's like the symbol of the Jewish people for the victory against the Greeks or Maccabees or whatever. And I told him, what? What do you mean? I was a girl and I wanted to be a queen. Now, I didn't have a lot of options. There was Queen Vashti and there was Queen Esther. Now, some people told me that Vashti was ugly. That left me with Esther. So I dressed up like Queen Esther each and every year. And in Passover, of course, my mom is the first mom to buy matzah. Lately, she is being more observing. She is buying matzah shmur. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, last Passover, I came to my house and I'm opening the closet and I'm seeing like matzah cookies, coconut cookies, uh, <laughs> peanut cookies, and I was like, okay, mom, any non-kosher cookies? <laughs> and she's like, what are you talking about? It's Passover. And I'm like, what? This is not even your holiday. <laughs> yeah, but it's Passover. And then I'm watching on the counter and I'm seeing matzah shmora. And I tell her, what the heck is that? And she's like, oh, this is not me. This is your sister. And I'm asking my sister, what is this? I have a, a picture in, on my Instagram that can prove this. <laughs> and I, um, I know what, what she's not, it's not me, it's your sister. And I'm asking my sister, what is it? Oh, the matzah shmora is much more, it's tastier than the regular matzah. <laughs> this is the family that I grew up in. It's like for us, Growing up among Jewish people in the Jewish society, for us, it was an obvious thing. It was a regular thing. It was something very natural, as natural as it can be. And, and you know, going through this and, and seeing this and, and experiencing this gave me some kind of an idea about that I cannot imagine my life in a different way. I cannot not imagine the months that I fasted Ramadan and went back and celebrated Hanukkah. It's for me, it was very obvious. And my, both of my parents are Muslims. But for me, it was very obvious. But at school, you know, it always was more complicated. And I remember that the days after a terror attack, it was, it was horrible for me to go to school the day after. I used to beg my parents not to go to school. I used to beg my parents not to, to see the faces of my friends because I knew what I'm going to face. I knew that I am going to face the blaming faces of my friends. And it was a very difficult time. It was a very complicated time because it was a time where people, you, the 90s, now you are, most of you not from the 90s, but it was a period of time where people used to go up on a bus and don't know if they're going to get back home. And images of explode, like buses that exploded in the streets filled the TV screen. And me as a kid going to, as a Muslim kid, going to school the day after a terror attack was something impossible. For me going and facing the blaming faces of my friends was something that I couldn't even digest and, and understand. So I remember that I used to beg my father not to go and I remember that my father used to take me to school, make sure that I would have gotten 
And before I went in, he told me, if you won't be able to face the world now, you won't, you won't be able to face the world in the future. And I went into school. And when I went into school, I heard my friends yelling and screaming, death to Arab, filthy Arabs, we need to kill them, we need to murder them all, we need to send them all to the sea. And then they watch me, their friend, standing aside and looking and not able to explain what somebody from my own people did. And when they looked at me, they told me, well, Lucy, we don't mean you. You know, you and your family are okay. All the rest of the Muslims, we need to kill them and murder them and send them off to the sea. And I have to tell you that when people are telling me until today that I wish all Muslims were like you. I hate the sentence. I cannot hear the sentence because this sentence has so much racism in it that people don't even start to understand. Because trying to imagine somebody telling you, oh, I wish all Jewish people were like you. Blonde and nice and, and <laughs> intelligent and without like no things that are showing that you're a Jew. With a small nose. With a small nose. <laughs> small, small nose. I got it often. Yeah. From your father through your mother. Okay. <laughs> so for me this sentence when people are telling me this today, I, I cannot say, and I have to tell you that for a period of time, I felt com like, com like with a, it's like, it's like a compliment. I felt very good with the sentence. I said, oh, I'm different. I'm different than the rest of the Muslims. I'm different than the rest of the Arabs. But growing up, I understood that this sentence has so much racism in it that <laughs> I was taking part of this also and taking my role into it. So I can tell you that um, being a journalist in uh, Israel, you know, when you're growing up, you're saying to yourself, no way that I will go through again the things that I went through when I was a child. No way that I will be able to face what I faced when I was a child in a journalistic world. Because journalists are supposed to be liberal and open. And we are hypocrites. You're opening today your TV and your mission is to ask what? Why? What am I seeing? Are the people who are bringing me the news actually bringing me the news or they're bringing me something that they want me to think and they want to fill me with something that maybe I have no idea? You're opening your Facebook, you're opening your Twitter, you're all occupied with your iPhones because it's very important what you're doing right now, right, in your iPhone? I'm looking you up, actually. Uh-huh, you're looking me up. Sure. <laughs> you needed to do that yeah, before I got away the <laughs> It's what you are seeing on Facebook and on Twitter and the information that you're getting all day from these places. Who's telling you if it's right or wrong? Are you actually looking into the facts? Are you actually looking in what you're reading? Or you're only reading the headlines and you're saying, oh my God, you cannot imagine what just happened in Israel. You're never asking yourself what really happened. What is behind the headline? And behind the headlines, there are a lot of things that maybe you don't want to take part of. Or maybe you have no idea that you are not an object. I remember that uh, three years ago, I went for a job interview. And I was already well known in Israel. And I got into uh, the interview and um, 
it was in one of the biggest websites in Israel. And I did, and I did the audition. And I finished the audition and they told me, wow, you're amazing. You're exactly the person that we were looking for. I went out. And I looked for something in my bag and I heard them saying, well, she's amazing, but she's Arab. And, you know, the ratings might fall the minute that she will appear on our screens. Now, it was three years ago in Israel. In Israel. And for me, I didn't want to believe that I actually heard that. I called my agent, and my agent asked me, well, how's the audition? I thought, wow, it was amazing. I, I fell out of their chair, chairs, like they were blown away. Telling me, well, it was great, but they said that I heard them saying this, this, and that. And I told her, now you're calling them, and you're telling them that I accept the job. Tell me what? Or you're calling them and you're telling them that I accept the job. And if they won't give me the job, they will find themselves reporting on one of the maybe racist job interviews that a journalist went through in Israel. <clears throat> the next day, I got a phone call telling me, oh, we're welcoming you to our company. Thank you very much. We're very excited that you're going to be part of our crew. I went in and I showed them that each and every time that I went on screen, the ratings went up. And the minute that the Jewish anchor went on the screen, the ratings went down. <laughs> and six months later, I left the job. I quit. Why am I telling you this story? Because being in this place and sitting here, it is not obvious for me. It's not obvious that I'm speaking in front of you. It's not obvious for me that I got to the point that I got, that I reach out to the point that I reach out. And it's not obvious for me because we are living in a century where we are more occupied with ourselves than with our society. I did a test getting into a subway in New York City. I got in, you know, there is no reception in the subway, nothing. Well, even if you really like to have a reception, you have no reception. And yet I found people, people are not able to disconnect from this. Not able. And this became a reason for us not to create eye contact. We're not able to look at each other and actually create a conversation without looking at our iPhones, without looking at our smartphones. We lost the connection, the human connection between people because we're looking for excuses in our smartphones. And I did a test. And I sat and I put my smartphone in my pocket and I started looking at people. And I started smiling at people. And they felt uncomfortable. <laughs> they didn't understand why I'm smiling to them. They didn't understand why I'm looking at them and actually trying to connect and to create an eye contact. <laughs> <laughs> and to create something, some kind of a conversation. And people actually looked at me like I'm a crazy person. Now, you can imagine that if I would have just talked Arabic in the subway, how 
it could have ended up. <laughs> Maybe me and the CIA offices under a really severe investigation. We're afraid to connect. And the more that we are afraid to connect, the more we are creating gaps between us. The more that we don't know each other, the bigger the gap is. We are afraid to know something that is not us. We are afraid to actually connect in a different language, in a human language. You're today texting your friend when he is sitting next to you. Yeah, you're just joking because it's correct. You're texting your friend and you're sending email to someone who's sitting just right in front of you instead of telling him this. And this is part of what is happening in our society. And this is part of what is happening in our lives. Because being disconnected from one another it's also bringing the, you know, everybody, we're, uh, people who are studying uh, political science probably study clash of civilizations. The clash of civilizations is, is right now. It's always happening. When you have clash of civilizations, something will happen. Somebody knows somebody or somebody is afraid of someone and, and it's clashing. The civilizations are actually getting far from each other. We don't want to know about one another. And this is exactly what is happening in Israel. In Israel, for example, there is a new discussion. Mizrahi Jews, new old discussion. Mizrahi Jews, Ashkenazi Jews are fighting one another all the time. Jewish white people are against Jewish black people. Racism of Jewish white people against Jewish black people. Orthodox Jews or secular Jews against Orthodox Jews, and vice versa. It's not that it's only Israel, when people are hearing Israel, they're directly seeing the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Oh, believe me, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is one of the smallest problems right now in Israel. It's not the problem of Israel. The problem of Israel right now is that Israel is not able to live with its own diversity. Israel is not able to live with the different colors that Israel has. And when people are not in peace with themselves, they cannot be in peace with somebody else. Yeah. I just want to mention that we have 10 more minutes. I yeah. don't know if you plan to give time for questions and answers, but if yeah. you do, so maybe... You were 40 yeah. minutes late. I'm sorry, that was my fault. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it again. <laughs> it's not my fault. I'm sorry, okay. Anyway, if you have time to give time, I'll show that. Yes. So, what I'm saying... Sorry to leave. We have our events going oh. back to us. I'm yeah, sorry, the organized bus is going to be now. Sorry. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Are you sure that they're living now? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and to start looking what you are also doing wrong in every single relationship that you have, in every single thing that you're doing. And in order to start correcting or to want to protect something or anything, I'll be talking to you about women. <laughs> Just in a minute. You need to start change, changing also things in yourself. And I can tell you that I wouldn't have been in this room if I didn't reach to a point where I started asking myself, what did I do wrong? Where I was taking a big role in the game of the blaming game. So you wanted to ask something? Right. Well, thanks for yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's because it was, I mean, you said one of the things that we should be doing right now is asking ourselves, what are we doing wrong? I think that one of the biggest issues that causes a lot of, uh, it's almost as if those, and I don't know who those people are, they can sense this insecurity in us now that we're susceptible to their opinions of what wrong and right is. And we're to the, we're to the point where there is no wrong and right. So when you say that, what is it that we're doing wrong? How can we even begin to question that when everybody has such an extreme variation of what right and wrong is? Are you following me? I'm For trying. example, somebody <laughs> might do something really messed up. Or someone might say, you know, it's bad that we're not really into, uh, you know, people to people um, dialogue, relationships, and that we're always just fixed on ourselves and technology, but then there's all these messages that will argue and say that that's really what matters at the end of the day. You see what I'm saying? So I see that kind of problematic. I think that. Uh I don't think that there is something that is right or wrong in the world. Like not everything is is good and evil. I know that some leaders in the world once uh, separated the world between good and evil. So no black and white. That's what you're saying. No black and white. That's great. And if we would have lived in black and white world, it's it would have been more problematic than it is today. I find it very problematic that you will find people today seeing somebody being attacked on the street and they will go and pass next to it and not do anything. This is wrong. When you are occupied with yourself, you're saying, okay, I don't want anything to do with that. Okay, somebody, maybe he's being attacked because there was an inner fight or whatever. The fact that we are not intervening about the wrong things that we are seeing in our society, it's a major issue. The fact that we are being irrelevant in our own societies, it's a big issue. You cannot be irrelevant in your own society. You cannot sit aside and say, okay, this too will pass, because this too won't pass. Because racism doesn't pass if you don't fight it. And racism is wrong. What is happening right now in the American society, it's wrong. If 100 years after slavery, we're still talking about black and white in the United States of America, the land of opportunities, there is something wrong. Yes? Well, touching upon that, where is the line that she should draw? Because I've heard, there, to me, there's like two different groups of people. One that will say, with issues like racism or whatever it may be, if you don't talk about it, then there's no way to expose it and assess it and analyze it. And then there's the other group of people on the other side of the spectrum that say, well, it's because we keep talking about this that it's still very evident 100 years from now. You know uh, what is the worst thing? Is 
the people that stood aside and do, didn't do anything. And I think that Einstein once said that. The world biggest like miss uh, you know I, I don't know catastrophes are being done by the people who stood aside and didn't do anything. But is doing something about it mean what the media is doing right now would say for example um, Black Lives Matter and Of course like this is something also this is listen I, I don't put all the blame on the media but the media has a lot to blame because in essence, that's kind of what's happening with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. When, right? when you are showing, for example, it's like what I'm talking about, like when you're showing on TV, only uh, Islam, for example, in a bad matter. You're not showing Muslims who are successful, and you're not showing rich Muslim families, and you're not showing... Uh, I don't know, follow Muslim politicians that did something good. No. The only Muslims that are dominating the news are terrorists. And the media has a lot to do with it. Not because the majority of Muslims are terrorists. No. It's because it's much, it, it's much sexier to show terror than to show good. Also, sell better in the end of the day. The media owns by private hands, and people need to make money out of it. So, if you can make money by something that you can sell, there is something that uh, somebody told me concerning Hillary Clinton. They told me that, and, and Donald Trump, they told me that bad messages are sexier than good ones. Mexicans are rapists. You remember that? The wall between Mexico and the United States. Muslim terrorism. Bad messages sticks with us. It's slogans. It's just, it's a title. And I think that also, we, as a Muslim, have something to do with that. Because we didn't pick up and said, whoa, 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 this is not me. This is not us. I didn't scream out loud and said, this is not representing me. After September 11, it was very, very comfortable in one way or another for Muslims to just shut up and not stand up and say, this is not us. Because it was so scary to say something else that the dominating voice became the voice of him. So it's very natural to say that Muslims, all Muslims, are connected to terrorism. Somebody else? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned you celebrated Jewish holidays, like Hanukkah and Passover. Why? Uh, <laughs> that, why not? Exactly. Yeah. Why not? Well, it, just, it just seems very... Odd to me, like I don't celebrate Christmas, I don't celebrate Easter. I'm, I'm not passing judgment. I'm just trying. Is that a normal thing most Arab Israelis do? Or no? <laughs> <laughs> it was just the, just the family that I grew up in. It's like when you're living. I lived in Dimona uh, because I, I didn't. I lived in a, a Jewish town, and we were the only Muslim family okay. in this town. So, and I was the only Muslim girl in school. It doesn't leave you a lot of options, so you just grow up and you celebrate all the holidays. Did you ever question it? No, I never questioned it because for me it was very normal. Although all the Muslims and the Arab society in Israel really love matzah. <laughs> they can have it all. We <laughs> everything that you love, that you hate, we love. It's like they're, we're calling it the Jewish cracker. <laughs> and it's great. <laughs> um, so I know you've had like some involvement with like, Stand With Us, or at least you're featured in some of your stuff. <clears throat> and I'm curious, um, I guess from like a university student perspective, uh, when they like bring do these tours of um, Muslim speakers to our Zionists, it seems 
and a lot a lot of times it seems like kind of fake or like tokenization. And I think it, from our perspective, it kind of separates um, people more, like it divides people more because Jewish ac Jewish advocacy uh, students will be like, oh well, this one. Uh, Arab that I know it supports Israel, so I don't have to talk to the rest of the Arabs on campus because, well, he must be right. So I'm curious what you think about that whole kind of industry. Ha! Uh, listen, Israel is no saint in what is happening in Israel and the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. I'm not going to sit here and tell you, wow. We are perfect. Israel is perfect. No. It's far from being perfect. The Palestinians are no saints either. Believe me. I think when, it, when you're coming from the perspective of, of saying, what do you want from us? We're amazing. We are like democratic. We have a democracy, we have a country, but on the same time, you're admitting that you are occupying by international law, you cannot be perfect. You cannot. Now, you cannot start an argument by saying, I'm okay, it's not me, it's him. These are the Palestinians, they're doing all the wrong. And for the Palestinians, it's the same thing. It's not us. We are perfect. We're not going out and stabbing people. We are perfect. We're not doing this because we want to. It's because the Israelis are making us. It's because of Israel. The only difference is that when the Palestinians are saying it, it catches the attention. Because the Palestinians are on the the weak side of this conflict. And Israel is on the strong side of this conflict, specific conflict. I'm not talking about what is happening in the Middle East, I'm talking about this specific conflict. When you are recognizing to the world and going on stages all over the world and saying we are pro two-state solution and we need to do two-state solution but on the ground it's not happening and you're saying one word to the world and one word to your coalition inside Israel nobody will believe you and the world will continue telling you honey you are occupying and the occupation and maybe we will start listening to you. Now this discussion will always be going until somebody will find a solution. On campuses, I know that it's not easy to defend Israel. You don't have to defend Israel. You have to humanize the problem of Israel. You cannot defend things that you know in one way or another that are wrong. You have to humanize and make people understand that they don't know shit about what they're talking about. They have no idea what they are talking about. They have no idea if you will ask them, where is, if a reporter on MSNBC, I think it was, or NBC, I, I, ABC, said that in the capital of Israel, Tel Aviv, there was a terror attack. There is a big issue. <laughs> if there is a reporter that is saying, after a terror attack in a synagogue, that a Palestinian was killed after a terror attack in a mosque, and I'm talking about a reporter in CNN. It's, it's a problem. So people are getting mixed up with the facts. People are very comfortable to be mixed up with the facts. 
but you have to humanize the problem and you have to admit that there is a problem. You cannot sit down and say, I'm perfect. No, I know that I'm wrong, but hey, these are my people there. This is my friend, Avi. This is my friend, Daniela. This is me living there. I had a lot of criticism from a lot of people who, who worked with me. I worked in a glad kosher hotel in, a, in Jerusalem as a Shabbos Goy. <laughs> and uh, I remember that they used to ask me all the time, how, it's like, how come you're protecting them? How come you are protecting the soldiers? How come you can protect these murderers? And I told them something very simple. They are not murderers. This is Oded and Dudu and Lotan and Avi and David. They are my friends that I just studied for my exams. We just finished high school together and now they are protecting me on the border or they are fighting for my safety also in a war. I cannot hate my friends. They are my friends. You are saying that my friend is a murderer and I know that he is not because just yesterday we studied together for a math exam and for a history exam. Humanize the problem. I'm sorry, I know that uh, we can stay much longer, but we have time for one more short question. So just choose last question. Last question, short one. So question for you. you, you spoke a lot now about humanizing the problem and I think in a way the fact that you grew up in Dimona with a lot of Jews around you allowed you to do that. Most of the other Israeli Arabs does not have Matzah Shmua, they probably didn't go to school with Dudu. And a lot of it is the indoctrination in the education system in Israel. Do you think that there is something that the Arab community can be done? Do you think that there is a voice inside to say let's create integration between Jews and Arabs in the schools? And how do you think that you can take your amazing message and also impact the broader art population that loves seeing you on television but might be voting for Hanin Zuabi at the same time? I think that um, uh, you cannot affect all the people. You, uh, when you're asking me this, you're asking me to change all the people, all the Israeli art views, and I can't. Some of Israeli arts are not agreeing with the way that I see things. They don't agree with my way. Some of the Israeli Arabs do agree with that. And they're saying, okay, this is our voice, but it's good that she's talking and not us. <laughs> she's getting all the flames. I think that uh, a lot of things are starting with education. I think that the Israeli government is not doing enough in concerning education. When you're going to schools, here in the United States, most of you are going to school with Muslims and Christians and the ones who are not going to Jewish school. <laughs> but most of the people who are going to public schools, they're going to public schools and there are a lot of people, black, white, Muslims, Christians, everybody are studying together and they're studying in one language. So in Israel we have two official languages, but nobody's actually studying neither of the sides are actually studying these languages. You won't find a lot of Israeli Jewish people who are speaking Arabic except the guy who's uh, <laughs> sitting behind yeah. us and he's a very well-known journalist, Arab affair analyst in Israel. You, you. <laughs> well done. <Yeah. laughs> he speaks better Arabic than me. I swear to God. And you won't find a lot of Israeli um, I would say Palestinians who speak Palestinians living in the West Bank and the yeah. Gaza Strip who speak Hebrew. In Israel, most of the Israeli Arabs are speaking Hebrew. I can say that 90% of Israeli Arabs are speaking Hebrew. When 90% from the Jewish Israeli community are not speaking Arabic. Now you're asking people what, what, we're talking about Israel. 22 Arab countries are surrounding Israel. So, okay, 
In Israel, you are a majority. But in the region, you are a really small minority. And you need to know your re region. You need to understand the language. You need to understand the music. You need to understand the subtext. Because the music, I don't mean Um Kartum and Abdul Halim Hafiz. No. Mm -hmm. I mean the music of Arabic. I mean the subtext of Arabic. Because if you want to know somebody, you need to know the subtext. I know six languages. Why? Because you think that I'm geek? Yes. <laughs> okay, but I also know that a language is a tool to bring people together, to understand you. I wouldn't have been able to speak in front of you if I wasn't able to speak English. If I didn't sit in my room, sit in my room and, and try to speak English in a fluent way. And, and I was very, like I had a problem with the words word and world. <laughs> my mom used to get in because she used to hear me, word, word, world, word, for hours, <laughs> hours. So it was very important for me to know the person who is sitting in front of me and to know your language. So education is a key. Education is also a key to know the other and to fight incitement and to fight this fear that we're talking about by not knowing one another. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>